hi, i'm jamie mawchuk, education consultant for the wisconsin valley library service this is our third and final recorded webinar of twenty twenty for this one we have marge luck waters who is a retired youth services librarian who now is a library consultant talking about library programming this webinar is called upping your virtual programming game and marge shares a lot of tips and tricks for working on virtual programming so let's go ahead and take a look at what marge has to say and i will see you when we're done with the webinar hi everyone i'm marge lockwaters and i'm a youth library consultant and i work for the southwest wisconsin library system and we're going to talk today about upping your virtual programming game and I picked this picture on the front because, you know, I think it says a lot about how everyone has really had to be ready to keep leaping into the ring during COVID-19, despite what we think we would rather be doing. So the virtual program we're going to be thinking about today isn't just about your online offerings, but we're also going to be talking about ways you may be offering program that isn't like active programming that you were doing during the pre-COVID times. And that's the kind of program when I say active programming, which was most often a presenter of some kind, it might be library staff or someone you've hired, and then a live audience of your patrons. So to start off, I do wanna state the obvious, 2020 has thrown us for a loop. I am sure none of us expected when the year began that we were going to live through what 2020 has thrown our way. So I, as kind of a favorite meme on the right hand side of your screen that I saw, it feels exactly like that. Time, you know, March, like an April took an eternity and then <laughs> it's kind of whipped by in some ways. So where are we at? Of course, it's been an especially challenging time with all of the pandemic challenges. And I could add into my equation also societal challenges that we've had. And certainly library challenges. We have less patron contact and some of the contact that we have has been a bit testy. Uh, we've had challenges to keep things safe, not just for our patrons, but also for staff members. And we all know that personally, we've been experiencing tremendous stress and that our communities, the people, the families, the businesses in our communities have been experiencing tremendous stress and burnout as well. And one of the things we're seeing in our libraries is that our online programming attendance or our um, remote attendance or pickup of remote grab and go kinds of bags and, and our uh, in house circulation statistics, all of these may be plateauing or just simply declining. When this pandemic started, I think there was a sense of we're all in. Uh, but you know, it's really hard physically and mentally and emotionally to keep going in a crisis mode for months on end. A recent article talked about how we all kind of stood up and met those challenges of the pandemic very robustly uh, as it began. Of course, we were all pretty nervous about it, I'm sure, or some of us were, I was one of the nervous people. But as this pandemic has dragged on, it has taken a toll on everybody emotionally and psychologically. And it's because we're not used to being in a crisis mode constantly. There was, in this article that I was reading, one of the things that it mentioned is that when we do have a crisis, a flood, fire, a hurricane, a tornado, 
you have this event happen and then you deal with that disaster and from there you start into a period of recovery and then you put your energy into recovery and the problem for us is this crisis mode that we're in has not stopped we are not in recovery at the moment that time will come but that's why it's so draining on us and especially when we're at this point after nine months or so it's also really normal to wish for things to be the way they used to be and you, you hear that a lot I just want you know to get back to normal and that's because our brains like to see our expectations met they like to see that the reality that we want is what we're seeing so brains like predictability and this isn't happening right now the New York Times also had an excellent article recently talking about creating the importance of creating new routines during a pandemic to help our brains and us get along and you'll find both of these articles in the resource document so much of what I'm talking about that resource document is pretty rich with links so I will say to you that we are moving pretty nimbly away from that old oh but we've always done it that way I mean if you were kind of a traditionalist and you know you found a comfortable place and let us do it this way COVID has taught us that circumstances require us to respond in new ways and just think about it when when your libraries first closed and it was like well maybe for three weeks we'll be at home and then we went to limited services curbside services maybe finally getting the computers people could use the computers again expanding our wi-fi and then maybe opening for some browsing and then having to pull back again, phase back because of uh, surges in COVID. So these changes have been fast and furious. And of course, some of these changes are driven by circumstance, you know, the community you live in. How politicized has COVID been? And what are your funders and your patrons? What are they asking for? So while I think that these coming vaccines are exciting, it's also going to be a long time it's going to take those vaccines a long time to get to the uh, most of the population so we've got a, a good bit ahead of us our adaptation skills are going to be part of our work for a very long time i certainly have heard a lot of people talking about how much less fun library work has been that it's hard and and most of us are in libraries because we love them and we love working with our patrons so this has really been difficult and i think many of us started our programming during the pandemic with a lot of enthusiasm and and big learning curves i mean holy samoli balls um and in some ways we used strategies at the beginning and maybe even now that were successful during pre-pandemic times but we also have seen that as patrons have experienced a lot of online and virtual programming burnout as well um, has really come to the fore and also as life their lives have been continually stressful the response to programming has changed so we've got a lot of balancing on what we need to do and i think that also has created a, a lot of stress in our library lives but it's a good thing right here to pause for a moment and give yourselves a round of applause because i think we need to appreciate really the good work that we have done over the past nine months. There's a lot of innovations listed here that we have not always created or had going in the before times. I can't help that we will continue many of these services and programs after the pandemic is well behind us because, you know, really they're good. And 
I think it's important to give ourselves those pats on the back for these innovations, for these successes, as well as kind of as we think about this good stuff, we can start looking at how we're going to do our planning going forward in a way that helps us continue this kind of positivity. So we'll create worthwhile programs while we feel worthwhile. And that's why I want this slide here because I really want everybody to feel powerful in what they, you've already accomplished. And in no way when I talk about upping your programming game am I saying anybody's doing anything wrong. I'm just saying we need to maybe refocus ourselves and one of the ways that we can do this refocusing is asking ourselves some balanced questions. So how can we plan more purposefully as we go forward? So knowing we've got some very fraught circumstances. A big part of the equation is how are we going to create those this balance as we think about our programs we need to consider our capacity and by that i mean what can we and our staff members if we're doing management and supervision what can we handle realistically in order to stay healthy uh, both physically and emotionally mentally And then I want us to consider our push towards creativity. What level of creativity do we really need to expend in providing programming and service? And I think this speaks to our willingness. And we need to be willing to not always hit a home run out of the park when we're creating and doing programs, but be willing to accept um, this is pretty okay in the time of COVID. Again, services everywhere are diminished. And it doesn't mean what we're doing a poor job. It means you need to leave yourself some space mentally for your home and your family and, and the other pieces of library work so that you can't put all of your eggs in one, in one basket. So I think you got to do some balancing there. And then, as we plan our programs, is what we are thinking about sustainable? Is it going to be something that we can do and be able to continue regardless of obstacles that we might stumble upon? And speaking of obstacles, you know, I, I don't have to tell you this. I mean, although maybe I do because, you know, it's been quite nice weather in the northern tier states, I must say, for the past couple of months. But we know we do have significant challenges ahead for the next three months because of the cold weather that is coming and winter. And also this um, very distressing continuing upward trend of COVID cases. We've been really lucky to have a long fall and a very late onset of winter. Although this other little devil on my shoulder is saying, of course, that's because of climate change, but I'm gonna just not listen to it um, and just keep hoping. I, I myself like winter, so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm gonna be that person who is just hoping against hope that uh, we get a fine winter yet so I can do some outside things. Anyway, with that said, it becomes even more important that we ask ourselves these balance questions because it leads us to more intentional and focused program planning to make the most of this winter challenge. When we plan with intention, I think that it helps us to avoid getting lost in, I call it the maze of complexity. That's why I've got this maze picture here. Sometimes we make things a little too hard and a little too complex. And so with good planning, we get to take a straighter path 
to decide what's doable in the programs and really in our services and collections as well. So um, less complexity is a good thing. And it also speaks to our being realistic about ourselves, about you know, those that we may supervise as well as our patrons. So because we know, we understand the pressure everybody's feeling, planning with intention helps us think about those pressures as we're doing our planning. So let's look at a couple of ways that intentionality and focus can come into play when planning our services and programs. These may be ideas that you've already worked on or it may be things that you can give a try. So the first thing I wanna talk about is less can be more. And I wanna be radical here and suggest that you shorten the length of your online programs. The length of time that you can get away with in a face-to-face -face live program is far, far different than in an online program. Now, I just wanna tell you a short story. During the last decade, when I taught online graduate courses in library science, the recommendation to us as lecturers, as teachers, was that our online lectures should be no longer than 15 to 18 minutes. So, so a weekly lecture, you know, sometimes I would tell you I would do 19 minutes, but I mean, I kept it down because research shows that engaging students online is a far more difficult process than in a usual one to three hour face-to-face -face class. So the recommendation was also we could do multiple lectures if needed, although that wasn't really recommended. But it taught me the importance of short and lively lectures. And I think it can be a lesson for all of us as we do our virtual programs, whether it's for adults or for kids. And speaking of kids, um, I just want to say I learned from a teaching friend of mine that kids have an attention span that is about equal in minutes to their age. So five years old, about five minutes. Eight years old, about eight minutes. I will tell you, I'm 67 years old and I do not have an attention span of 67 minutes. So somewhere this formula does fail. Um, but this attention span of minutes to age was recommended for face-to-face -face teaching. So face-to-face -face programming, but I kept that in mind and really thought about it. So what might this look like for your online programs? Well, I think it means that we need to reconsider offering 30-minute online story times or 45-minute or 60-minute online programs for school agers or even adults. For instance, if you wanted to do a online story time with preschoolers, reading just one book with an opening and closing song would be an excellent story time online. And then perhaps the next week, it would be a flannel board finger play and opening and closing song. And then the next time, a book. So it's really something that is, you're grabbing the attention, you are also having that opportunity to speak heart to heart with your patrons and the parents. So it's an important part of how you reach out to your kids or to your families or to your adults, that, that give and take, that interaction that you usually have. And I think I wanna mention that the Aram Public Library in Delavan, Wisconsin does some really wonderful approaches with their online programming. And, and in particular, they have a snuggly story time in the evening, that's just one story and then that warm interaction. I also uh, want to draw your attention to this graphic, the countdown to noon for the Northfield Public Library in Minnesota. And they are literally having a five minute or uh, Emily Lloyd, their youth librarian said it could be eight minutes program. And it is that countdown to New Year's and they're going to have pots and pans and shout Happy New Year and sing Old Lang Syne and uh, just very brief. And 
and it's just a little celebration. Now this is taking shortness to the extreme, but I think it's gonna be pretty successful and I can hardly wait to talk to Emily and see what she has to say. The other thing you can really think about is having, I, mean, I, I, I hope none of this is just heresy when I'm suggesting some of these things, but decreasing program frequency. So if you're doing a weekly program, think bi-weekly or monthly, and that can be a good strategy. Some of you may know Angela Hurst, who is a wonderful PR guru you may be familiar with. And she has bright and uh, fabulous ideas. She's got a lovely little video that she um, shares. And in a recent one, which is in your resource doc, she's reflecting on Zoom fatigue and really urges us to think about quality rather than quantity and suggest simply doing fewer programs. So I, I you know, I, I really want to applaud her on that. And she also suggests we think about what our community is really asking for so that the programs match what our community wants. And, you know, one of the strategies that you can do with your weekly programs is if you do want to stay weekly is vary that content. So instead of having a cooking series or a maker series, one week you have cooking at the same time, the next week you have the makering, you know, the third week is more of an informational program. So that's one way to kind of, again, um, have fewer programs. You don't have to bombard everyone with programs. And Angela also suggests changing, I love this, and it, it isn't part of this, part of our the, the webinar we'll get to some ideas for presentation later but she suggests changing where you film and what you're wearing when you film to different locations whether that's from room to room or uh, she also suggested when you're if you're doing outside things there was a story time where someone would be doing you know story time with lambs and then sometimes story times with chickens which I can't even imagine would be easy in any case I think I suggest looking at the Frank B. Kohler Library in Manitowish Waters, Wisconsin. Look at their Facebook page because they do a really brilliant job in, in having kind of uh, short, not programming all the time, but having short and very funny videos in different locations. So that is also something to try. I also think that your planning if for simplicity is keeping your finger on that pulse of what people are interested in at the moment. A lot of libraries right now are looking at doing self-care or de-stressing focused programs for adult content. And for teens, a lot are playing with online games and content provider platforms like TikTok that bring teens together and take some pressure off what is your content going to be? Many other libraries I have found really delightful book talking, uh, short book talking programs, and some will do new books where they bring them out of a box and say, look what got delivered today. And of course it hasn't been <laughs> delivered today or you probably couldn't book talk it. But it just adds some oomph to people's reading choices and of course to your library circulation. It's also important to expand our thinking on what that a virtual program is, right? So as I spoke about it at the beginning of our time together, it can be remote, it can be off-site or an offline program as well as an online program. So I'm, I'm really loosely defining virtual as you're just right not, you're not in front of people, okay? So it's everything else that we're doing. I hope that you consider grab and go bags a program because they are. Angela Hurst, again, referring to her, asks, would you consider a blog post a program? Like if Facebook is what you're on or you have a library blog, if you did a post on there, and she's saying that's a program. She encourages us to play with formats like, like blogging and perhaps doing a short video with a guest and then cutting little clips of that video and inserting them in different places in that blog post or over a series of days. So you can intercut your writing with those little teeny pieces 
with your interview. So, you know, there are simple ways to do this kind of thing. And then know your limits and recognize when it's time to dial back or really to delay a great idea to keep your stress levels down. We can't always be crows about this thing where we see, ah, a shiny thing, and you grab it. Oh, another shiny thing, and you grab it, and you bring it up to your nest, and you go, oh, all these shiny things. Oh, here's another shiny thing. We can't do that. It's okay to not do it all at once as well. So you don't have to be a superhero by doing all the things. Working in this time of a pandemic demands really a different pace and a different strategy. You're a superhero without doing everything, just being open and providing a level of service to your patrons is heroic right now and solving these problems. So, you know, keep a steady hand on that tiller. I want to turn now to the elephant and that's in the room, and that is stats and data. I hear a lot of worry and concern about how to handle decreased stats that are resulting from this plateauing and the decreasing attendance at programs or while doing remote services or we're making fewer, you know, grab and go bags. So first of all, I want to say that throughout the country, 2020 will always be what I call an asterisk year. And I mean by that, that stats and data on library services and programs will never ever match previous years. Never. They just won't. As one librarian wrote, trying to compare 2020 to any other year statistically is like comparing apples to the apocalypse. So I think we need to turn our worry about this. We need to lay it to rest because Every, and, and this isn't just libraries that can't compare. I mean, you just look at any, any article, listen to any news show, and businesses talk about the percentage of drop in their businesses. You know, I think only um, online businesses are doing well on any level. But everywhere, everything is down and depressed in terms of stats. So, you know, it, it's a cultural, societal-wide issue. So I think it's good to think instead about telling your library story. This type of advocacy helps you kind of break out of the data description into what I consider an equally powerful means of relaying your library story during this time. So rather than concentrating on numbers, think about anecdotes and stories about what your programs offer. What kind of difference did each make? What kind of stories and feedback have you heard? What do you know? So what are some of the things that you know? Well, if you've um, done Facebook Live, you'll often see comments and hopefully you've grabbed some of those comments. I recommend people when they're doing Zoom programs, whether they're gonna make them available or not, to record them. If you have recording capabilities, record them and then look and, and ask questions during your program that elicit feedback and then look at those chats and ask people to, to put things in chats. Look at those chats and gather some of the, st the stories people are telling you about how they appreciate it or, or pieces that give you a chapter or a paragraph or a sentence in your story. You also will know how many Say, for instance, you're doing a grab and go bag or a take and make bag. How many of those you prepared and were taken? And you can kind of chart that so you can get a sense of how things are going. And also be able to say your story may be that 
you you have seen a continuing lessening of use of those resources and here's how you reacted and what you did so i think you have to think of that big picture when you're doing program programming especially in this time of real curtailed services in all sectors of our society what were your library programming wins and again think about that slide from our round of applause and if you start looking at it this way you're going to find a lot of great reasons that both the library and the community can really celebrate your progress i want to turn here now from planning kind of um, some of those overarching issues i want to look a little bit more closely just briefly about upping your presentation game because that is a big part of what most libraries are doing we have some online component of programming that we're involved in so we've talked about purpose purposeful that's hard for me to say purposeful planning i could make a well we won't go there so let's look on a bit about being purposeful in making a more effective presentation when you're involved in that online programming work. And I totally get it, not everyone is comfortable being on camera without an audience in view to respond with you, or even if you, you do have an audience, it's just sometimes it's hard to present, I get that. But there are some things you can easily do to help you present more comfortably or appear more comfortable to your audience. If you still are experience this discomfort, you will look more confident. As you prepare, think of how you can vary your content or presentation style a bit if you are doing a longer presentation. So this is where I think a story time model can be helpful. So when a librarian puts together their story time. They are using interchangeably books, movement, songs, visuals to keep each segment of that story time down to about between a minute to four minutes. So that really works nicely for tots. And I'm, I think you can do the exact same thing for adults and teens. Break things up a little bit. So you can use icebreakers, you can use and ask people to respond in the chat box. You can use pop trivia. You can do quick quips. You can do funny little uh, phrases, short poems, little rhymes. You can share funny memes or cartoons. So there's just ways that you can keep things moving. And it also may suggest that you would break up your presentation so you would have some different components. So you might show, you might talk a little, you might show a brief little video, you might have another person come in and do a small amount of talk. I mean, even when I'm doing my check-ins with system librarians, we do that monthly. We now add on a little 15 minute guest workshop, mini workshop. And it's really nice. So people get a little workshop without having to expend a lot of time, but still have time to share. So moving on, do practice what you are going to say. The more that you know your information or presentation, the better you're going to be at presenting that information. I mean, because you know it, so you believe it. And part of our information giving is sales work. I have to be bald here, but you're selling what it is you want people to know. So you want to be enthusiastic. So practice it out loud and or, or you read it over uh, enough time so to, that you're very comfortable with it. Practice is not going to be making it perfect, but it's going to make you more comfortable and confident. And then really take a look at where you're going to be filming through your computer's camera or your camera's lens. Are there are necessary light sources coming in behind you? Is your background super cluttered? I mean, the other day I, I went to a new spot and, and I put the camera on and I looked and oh my gosh, 
we put all our refrigerator magnets on the side of the fridge and they were all like cattywampus and oh I had to, I got to run over and like peel them off and leave a few uh, neatly ordered ones and it, it didn't look so bad but you know take a look is there an angle that you could turn your camera that works better for lighting and composition and if you do feel the need to put up a background sheet or curtain or paper behind you what does that look like through the camera I mean don't just put it up but take a look uh, one of my favorite fails on that was someone who had put butcher paper behind them which was really a great idea but unfortunately um, you know you need a lot of butcher paper so you're gonna have to you're just gonna have to have you know a couple of sheets taped together and where the person had the the tape was exactly right behind their head so it looked like they had a line coming out of their ears on both sides so, you know you could avoid that by checking the camera um, and I know some people use zoom backgrounds or backgrounds that are provided on different platforms but be very careful of that because you do look odd um, and I, I just I, I want to caution you about that you, I find people look like aliens a little bit but that's just me so if you do check out that selfie it can give you a lot of information that's going to help you improve your background I think you need to make sure that your camera lens is at eye level it's never fun to look up someone's nose although I, I will say looking directly at this dog's nose is kind of nice I think it's instructive to look at TV news shows and just see what the talking heads are doing and how they appear because most people are doing you know when they bring in speakers and guests from other places on news shows or opinion shows they're speaking from home and you will note that the talking heads the best ones are looking directly at you and the amateurs are looking down at their computer because you know so you don't have to get fancy to look directly into a camera you can have a fancy setup but you could also do what I do if you have any books around the house <laughs> just put your computer up on some books and get that camera so that you are looking directly at it it's also important to maintain eye contact with the camera as much as you can and this is challenging I will tell you that I do a lot of presenting and the key for me it may not work for you but for me it was naming my camera so I am speaking right now to Duca Baluca who is my good and dear friend and it's so much easier for me to look at Duca Baluca and talk and share because that's what we do when we're talking with our friends is we're looking at them directly so that's one small strategy that's worked for me and helps connected to the audience by looking at the camera and if you do have reading material it's great to place whatever it is that you need to read next to your camera lens so you don't have to constantly look down or look away to kind of follow whatever it is that you're going to be talking about and then there's important listening cues we have too so don't rush when you're speaking online it takes our brains a little bit longer to absorb information when we're not seeing the speaker so take your time I learned this from Jamie and I always hope and especially after today that I learned the lesson well because in our family we talk fast but do try to speak slowly and post-it notes can be very helpful when you are thinking about how to ease things for your listener they can keep you on track so right now over next to Duca Baluca's eye I have a post-it that says speak slowly because I don't want to forget that but you can also put keywords or concepts that you want to remember to mention to, so you can take your mind off worrying about that so for instance you may want to mention your next program coming up 
or you may want to mention a new service or you may want to mention a change in hours or whatever it is that you want to do have that post it right along your computer so you don't have to worry will I remember because there it is and if if you're really organized you can put them in the order of when you want to mention it and then whip it off your computer so then you'll be awesome and then do use pauses it takes confidence to feel that you can stop but it's a great way to help people catch up with what you're saying so keep that in mind as you are doing your presentations another important part of upping your presentation game is I think the issue of getting attention because that is also something that I think we're having a lot of challenges around so how you plan to market your programs and keep your public aware becomes pretty vital and when it comes to getting attention I think we all know that social media is a pretty big piece of our pie right now of how we're getting our word out you know that that lovely uh, word of mouth we used to be able to take care of at the circulation desk or at our frontline desks was really a helpful thing well that's really not as easy to get to right now so another lesson I learned from Jamie thank you Jamie was no matter how many social media platforms you're using you know Twitter Instagram Facebook library blog it's important to really focus on one pick one type of social media to get your the main bulk of the PR that you want to get out the messages that you want to get out pick one so that you can keep it populated and people have more of a, a go-to place to find the information it doesn't mean you can't use those other types of platforms but they become more secondary they become more so say Facebook is what you're picking your library Facebook page then if you use Twitter you're pointing people to the Facebook page so you're using any other auxiliary media platforms as arrows to point towards the main it's also if you want to get attention for your programs community partners can be a big help I think leveraging those networks asking them to pass on information about your services or collections or programs can be helpful and I think that when you are using your social media it's important to think beyond just boosting your programs but also mixing up your focus so you want to also highlight books a new service perhaps do a short behind the scenes video and I'll again uh, throw um, great uh, praise upon the Frank B Kohler library in Manitowish waters they do a really fine job with that kind of playing around with content on their Facebook page including uh, short and snappy videos so I really recommend it when you're thinking about this then I also think this is really a time if you can and and can think of patrons who are active on whatever is your main uh, social media platform that you select engage patrons and ask them would they be willing to if you send them specific you know um, or tap them in specific posts you know put their names and would they share it on their timeline um, to kind of create a telephone group of interested patrons that can help you amplify what it is you want to do I mean I think you want to be cautious about this and not go insane but you know for something that you really want to give some love to I also think that it's important not to be afraid of surprising people so to keep 
the attention of patrons, it's great to mix it up. And it's, it's fun when our community isn't kind of sure what we're going to come up with next on our social media accounts. So you could just put something up monthly or quarterly. Um, and, and whether that's just highlighting something that's outside the box for you, you know, maybe you're creating do it yourself story time kits or uh, some kind of uh, cool scavenger hunts with your businesses or you're doing a librarian pen pal service with long ter term care residents or you know whatever it is um, leverage that surprise in your social media and you'll also see people responding so now we're going to turn to content you're you're hoping maybe i would get there or maybe disappointed that we are there because how could i tell you anything that you don't already know but we're gonna go there anyway we're gonna look at some programs that might surprise and delight patrons and what I want you to think about while we're looking at these is how you maybe used to create programs in the before times and urge you to continue to think about those programs and how you might adapt them so I'm not focusing here on more 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 you know shiny crow I'm talking about being thoughtful about the quality of your program. So, you know, maybe there's a patron favorite program you did in those before times that you don't think you can do now. And can you tweak it? So you will ask yourselves the same questions you've always asked yourself. What is catching the attention? What's popular? What are people talking about? What's the newest trend? I mean, I'll tell you my newest trend, and I had to write it out here because I'm going to say it, and you're, you'd go, what, what is that? And maybe you know. Uh, and that is that fabulous Norwegian word and concept about embracing the outdoors even in winter, free luft live. And how can you build a program around that? And I'm going to tell you how. Just yesterday, I went to a webinar put on by Colorado Libraries about outdoor winter programming and it was I am saying to you 45 minutes of nothing but great program ideas to do in the winter to encourage people outside and it was fantastic um, so because it's so new it's not in the the doc that I sent but I, I do have a link right here in the Google slide link so hopefully you can get to that because if you're dreading winter and programming this will help you but also what are the holes that are in your community that no other entities are doing that tells you your content and then of course who are your potential partners because this is such a good time to partner with people although people feel everyone's overwhelmed actually everyone is looking I think for ways to link with each other so speaking of upping your partnership game look around at those partners in you in your community that you already have built up and perhaps you can do uh, guest appearances in a video uh, have them come in you can do what this library uh, Schulzberg McCoy's public library in Wisconsin work together with their local businesses so all of these partners are important in coming up with um, content for you so do rely on them I'm also uh, thinking about your schools if they are back to virtual programming often they'll have a meals program that they bring out to the kids partner with them for book distribution uh, Winona Minnesota Public Library did that very successfully and continues to do that so there's a lot of ways uh, that we can keep our communication open with them if you're looking to up your children's game I just want to focus on three particular things that struck me um, in the first uh, stay home superhero this was done by the Grand Rapids Minnesota Public Library and they branded it so they, they branded a program which made it you know it's kind of like a summer reading program but they were doing this in spring so two or three times a week they would put a challenge out and it might be playing charades or drawing a picture or starting a garden in just any kind of thing this is a junk drawer robot and I'm sorry it's very blurry but basically it says go to a junk drawer find things make yourself a robot take a picture send it to us 
So it, it, it was very popular. And I would love to give you a better picture. I will tell you that um, this picture came from something I already had done, but I couldn't go on their Facebook group and go all the way back to March and April and May <laughs> when they were doing this, so I apologize. And when we talk about tweaking a program, when you see that dinosaur, the plastic dinosaur sleepover, this library, the Fort St. John, British Columbia Library, was so bummed they couldn't do a stuffed animal sleepover because of sanitation concerns. So they instead did a plastic dinosaur, had the kids drop off a plastic dinosaur and they rubber banded a tag around each little dinosaur's tail or neck and they got 75 dinosaurs to play and take pictures of and then re-sanitize and put out for the kids to pick up with um, a little, some printed out pictures of the dinosaur. So very easy to do a great adaptation. And then I must mention the Birchland, Ohio library for they do the very clever scavenger hunts and theme them by color or numbers or shapes rather than saying, you know, go find a fork. They're more complex. Find something soft that is white. Find two things that match that are black. You, you know, so they have a better, more open problem solving kind of scavenger hunt that I think is really delightful. If you're thinking of upping your teens game, uh, the Seguin, Texas Public Library created a, a teen choose your own adventure doc, a little like a digital escape room. And it's based on Hansel and Gretel. So you can decide whether you want a dystopian Hansel and Gretel, a fantasy or a present day. And it's really, really fun. And that link is in your resource doc and you are encouraged to buy that library. Uh, to use that resource. Down in the center, we've got the Pikes Peak Library that uh, themes a lot of their um, just basic science experiment and maker experiments and, and buildings and things. Uh, they link them to popular um, books and media. So this particular one is on Harry Potter. So it's just a way to up your game with your teens and do some branding. And then the best branding that I came across as I was uh, preparing this presentation was the Kansas City Library that has a staff member who's a certified yoga instructor. And she's taken it to a new place by having fandom yoga series. So they've already done the DC versus Marvel. So they, the yoga person did poses that would be a a DC villain or a DC hero and it very funny and then has also done Pokemon and it looks like the child of the Mandalorian and Harry Potter will also be coming up soon. So these are just ways to kind of again up that content make it a little bit more fun. And I have to say we've certainly discovered that passive is the new active. So our grab and go and make and take kits have been great. Uh, the Carrollton, Texas Library has uses um, the Among Us online game as themes for their teen make and take kits, and they do amazing things. The Naperville, uh, uh, Illinois Library has downloadable activities for school agers and preschoolers, and they also use these in their grab and go kits. And then if you're burning out on grab and go kit content, uh, you know, Pinterest. That's all I can say about it. And this Selena New York page is just one of many, many pages that has some great content. If you're looking to up your adult programming, here are some samples of both active and passive um, programs available. And I mentioned how de-stressing and self-care is important. And this New York library, the Everett, uh, DR Everett Library, they, they have a grab and go bag with, with little chocolates in and a coloring page and tea and a stress ball and some, you know, some of the bubble wrap to pop. So, you know, that's really responding to, to your patrons. The Rib Lake Library in Wisconsin has created community journals to 
people can check out for a week and they can fill in and draw on different um, subjects around the pandemic and they will then be put in archived in the collection so there'll be a snapshot always for the community of what this time was like and then on the right hand side of your screen the Fargo North Dakota Library they're doing a uh, for adults, they're doing a virtual pet show and tell, but I bet you it's a family affair as well. And I think that would be great fun since there's been a lot of pet adoptions, but maybe you can't adopt a pet and so you can just see everybody else's and enjoy them. Uh, and then the teacup, they're doing a tea tasting grab and go slash online program. So four tea bags, uh, in each grab and go bag, people make the tea ahead of time and test it and then they'll talk about the tea and then talk about how they felt about that tea. So what else can we do to keep our focus on service and programs? Well, I, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, there could be a lot of, and your resource doc is rich in ideas. You can just click anywhere and find a whole bunch of ideas. But I, I want to say that it's important to remember the fun. The library is a great source of comfort. So our friendly interactions mean the world to people. So even online, you know, talking directly to people and not being too scripted is important. Keeping some humor in our signage and our messaging, you know, keeping it light, being the example uh, for society. And I think keeping your, your uh, humor Upbeat PR, again, is really important. It's going to lift your spirits and it's going to help the library gain positives from your patrons and, and, and the community too. And I think, please, for more ideas, connect. Connect with your peers, check blogs, check some of those library uh, Facebook user groups. I hope you're all looking at uh, the Programming Librarian Storytime Underground you'll find so much in there to try. And you don't have to use them all, but something's going to fit. And then do keep up on things like webinars and CE. There's so, so many great things happening in Wisconsin and across, and across the nation. So keep your eyes on that and you will find a great amount of content for yourself. So I want to thank you very much for joining me today to see about upping your content. And I'm so glad that you had a chance to uh, explore with me. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at this email address. Wow. Thank you, Marge, for all of that awesome information. If you look at the description below, you will see several links. You will see a link to access the slides from this presentation. You will also see a resource handout, and there will also be a link to a survey. We would appreciate any feedback that you can provide to us. If you completed this webinar in full, this webinar is worth one contact hour for Wisconsin Public Library certification in category B and you will find an activity sheet that is already filled out for you. Again, thank you for participating in today's recorded webinar, Upping Your Virtual Programming Game. I'm Jamie Machik with the Wisconsin Valley Library Service. So long.